everybody. I want to make a quick video to update you on what's going on with the Spitfire. Not a really high production video or anything, just kind of want to show you what's going on. Currently, it is in Spitfire airplane mode with no wheels. Here's what it looks like with wheels, and uh, here's what it looks like with tracks. I think that would be kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, a younger me, uh, a more flagrant me, would have just driven 100,000 miles without ever looking under the car, but those days are gone. These days, I think I... Now, apparently I've grown up a little bit. I'm not really sure how that happened, but now I want to make sure it's completely safe before I trust it to get me somewhere. You know, the previous owner already did a lot of stuff. He did new hard brake lines, copper lines all the way back, which takes a lot of bending. It's not an easy job, so good for him. Uh, he also did a brand new distributor and uh, rotor and plugs and wires and all that good stuff. Uh, new fuel pump right there, you can see that. And there's a couple other things. I haven't taken off the rear drums yet, but I have a feeling there's new wheel cylinders and stuff in there. And the rotors and pads on the front are actually new. They do have a little rust on them already, but they are new. So you can see in there that there's some shiny new uh, clips holding in the pads. The pads have good life and there's not a lip on this. There's just a little bit of rust. So speaking of rust, that is kind of why I want to take some things apart. That's the original ball joint there. And you can tell by how much rust is on everything else. And uh, what you do is you take out two bolts here and then there's nuts on the other side and this comes apart and the ball joint, this whole piece comes out and you can see the ball joint in there. And then the tie rod is down here. Uh, it's obviously original as well. There's a bit of wetness coming from the inner tie rod. So I think maybe in the long term might do the whole rack, uh, but we'll get back to that in a minute. There's the tie rod. And then the other one is the uh, brake master cylinder. This is probably all the fluid from the brake master just kind of out there. Plus all the stuff that's in the car as you saw in the last video. But since the previous owner actually did all the brake stuff already except the master cylinder, I think once we do that, the brakes should be done. We'll flush everything out, put dot five in there so it doesn't have this whole corrosive property of dot three. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. And then I think the brakes are good. As you can see, there's new soft lines as well. So. I really do think after that point, the brakes will be good. And we'll just check the caliper seals and stuff while we have it apart. The rear of this car sags. And it's not really like a left to right sag so much as it is the entire rear of the car. Apparently that's due to the spring wearing out. There's some reason why Triumph engineered the spring the way it is now. And it has to do with the wheels tucking in on earlier models during hard cornering. So now, on these uh, 1500s, especially the late ones, the spring is so soft that over time, especially if you're a particularly rotund individual, the spring will wear out. So being an original car, I mean, as far as I can tell, you guys have confirmed in the last video, these are the original seats, or at least they're original Spitfire seats. The car's only got like 70,000 miles on it. And I don't think this is the original top because of this right here. Uh, on the other side here, you can see that this top has a date stamp on it of nine of 88. So I, I don't think that's the original top based on that, but it ain't new, but it's in still pretty good shape. I mean, the whole car is in pretty good shape. The worst rust, as you guys saw in the last video, is right here. And there's the rust right next to the uh, trailing arm. So my friend Justin, who has a shop next to me here in this complex, uh, is a welder. And so he's convinced we can get that fixed up in an afternoon. I don't know, it might be a little more than an afternoon, but so I've pulled the carpet back just now, and there's the hole in question, and it really does go all the way through. But there's the bracket for the trailing arm. That whole area looks to be completely intact. It looks like it's getting infringed on down there in the corner. All right, now you can see a little better. See the corner down there, it's starting to get in there, but really it's just this large hole that goes, I mean, all the way out. Out here. So, uh... I don't know if it's, well, I'm going to call it safe to drive. I know there might be some differing opinions on that, but I mean, there's still at least three quarters of the uh, structure here left. And the good news is the bracket looks good, so I don't think we'll need to buy a bracket. That bracket alone is like $85. So uh, hopefully we can save some money there and just weld a patch over that hole on the outside or inside, or I don't know, I'll leave that up to the guy who knows how to weld, because I sure don't. Here's that brake fluid again inside the car. And on that note, it might not be a bad idea to uh, pull this up and dry this area out. It's all kind of wet 
and all the paint starting to go from all that mineral fluid. Uh, and then it might not be a bad idea also to just patch that up so it doesn't get wet in here when it rains. Of course, <laughs> it's a spitfire. It's going to get wet in here when it rains one way or another, but at least it won't be coming up through the floor. You guys, I just found a little Easter egg here. Pulling up this side to see if there's any rust. Oh, what is that? Offenberg Chevrolet, Gary Cruz. Nothing on the back. That's good enough to tell me that Gary Cruz. Well, there you go, Gary Cruz, Offenberg Chevrolet. Now, I did find other paperwork in the glove box or glove area. This car at one time was owned by someone named Katie, uh, which is funny because my girlfriend's name is Katie. Weird. Also, uh, she was in St. Louis in a neighborhood that I was just in like a month ago, <laughs> driving around looking at buildings. And she had it roughly around the time I was born. So yeah, cosmic things aligning here. And this car, it's weird to think of it like that. You know, this thing was out doing stuff when I was born, you know, and on my birthday last year, the owner who sold it to me was getting it inspected. So it's like all throughout its history, it's, it's been kind of around the significant dates in my life. And uh, here it is in my garage. I love how this stuff works sometimes. This insurance card from Katie actually proves that she had it when I was born, which is really interesting. Also, this card from Gary proves that he had it insured at one time. I'm guessing he was working for the dealership and drove it around for fun. And then there's another character called Ken who had it from 1987 to 1988, which brings us to this list, which is as much as I can figure out of who had this car and when. It's strange because all of this paperwork was like neatly arranged in the glove box and yet there's a 28 year gap and we have no idea who the original owner was. Kind of weird. To me, the story of a car is damn near the whole thing, you know? I didn't buy any of these cars just because it was a Ford or a Honda, you know? I wasn't looking for one. It just happened to be that the story grabbed me and the patina grabbed me and the car grabbed me and that's why they're all here and that's why this is here. So here are all the parts that I've already purchased. These are all in the trunk. They're going to go on in the first wave. And then here are the parts that came with the car from the previous owner. I know what some of these things are. Obviously, we've got a new aerial antenna. We've got some new radiator hoses. And we've got a few new air cleaner components, including this little fun little doohickey here. A caliper repair kit, a full carburetor repair kit. I don't know what this is, guys. Maybe someone can help me with this. And I believe this is a fuel pump. And then there's a receipt here uh, from a company I'd never heard of called uh, MG Central for door seals. Evidently, if you go look on the car, it's got all new door seals. That's not cheap and not easy, so that's pretty cool. It's also got new liners here for the window. Nice. Stuff is really cheap for this car. You know, at least coming from like, let's see, where'd the Honda go? The Honda N600 here, which is now dad's Honda N600. Parts, you just gotta pay what somebody wants for them. I mean, they're so hard to come by. It's just exuberant amounts of money for stuff. And it's only when you can find it. You can't just go out and get it from Moss Motors, Victoria, British, uh, you know, seven other companies that stock parts for Triumphs. Heck, it's easier and cheaper to get parts for this than it is for the Corvette. Speaking of that, I'll do a car update video next, I think, to just give you guys an update of what's going on on all of these cars. It's nice that parts are so cheap for this thing because it's accessible, you know? Someone can restore this without a million dollars. And uh, when you're done, you have a really awesome car. You have a lot of fun, maybe not a lot of power, you know, but uh, enough power for what it is and you get to go out and have a good time with the top down. I said on Instagram recently, you could build two Triumphs in this condition. I could get all the parts I need for this thing twice before I get the parts I've needed for the Corvette. And the Corvette, as you can see, is still not running. <laughs> so, I mean, it speaks to how easy it is to find parts for these cars, how affordable it is, how approachable it is. Anybody looking to get into a classic car can get into one of these. I think that's pretty cool. So as I was saying, new rear spring, uh, basically, you undo a couple bolts, the whole spring slides out right here, and you spend about $200 for a stronger, better spring. 
put the new one in, and you're done. So rear spring, $200. Uh, front components, I think the long-term plan will be to take all of this stuff off, the A-arms and springs and shocks. You can get springs and shocks for, I think, $120, and then we'll just take the control arms off and paint them. Uh, and then you can get a rebuilt steering rack, I think, again, about $200. So, I mean, we're up to, what, $600, which is not a small amount of money, but it's a lot easier than taking the stuff off, blasting it, powder coating it, painting it, and all that good stuff. And the last thing is the sway bar. If you look down here, the sway bar mounts are completely shot. Uh, the sway bar links on the sides here are completely shot as well. And uh, again, you're not looking at a lot of money there in bushings and links and that kind of stuff. So we can paint the sway bar while it's off and I think we'll be good there. Oh, something else I discovered. Let me pop the valve cover off real quick and I'll show you why there's a bunch of oil everywhere in here. Kind of rudimentary, but all you do is you take these uh, flathead bolts out, two of them, and uh, the whole valve cover comes off. All right, you ready for this? Turns out the reason that there's a bunch of oil everywhere is because there's basically no gasket. See this right here? This is what's left of the original gasket. It is so hard that I can sit here with a screwdriver. I mean, there's just no pry in that. It sounds like hitting metal. For reference, this is what a new gasket is supposed to look like. This is how malleable it's supposed to be. This is probably the original valve cover gasket, and uh, it's a good reason for why there's a ton of oil. I was thinking the head gasket might be leaking, but if all this oil, which is, I mean, very fresh oil, if it's all coming from the valve cover, that would be good news. Uh, the other thing I can tell you that you can't see on video is it smells like it's been running rich. The oil viscosity is, uh, it's not right. It's got gas in it, and uh, well, you know, it's been around a rich. It is what it is. So we can tune the carb a little bit. Uh, we can change the oil and that problem will hopefully be fixed. But as you can see, somebody's been in here. There's some shiny new hardware in here and uh, it all looks pretty nice. So I don't really see anything that jumps out at me as strange. Uh, it seems like the springs still have enough play and they're moving freely and there's not a lot of crud everywhere in here. So I think it looks good. Let me get to the other side and show you the springs. And you can see here the valve springs and they all, again, they look fine. So, looks fine. I, I don't know. We're not going to get all deep into this engine if we don't have to. But I did get a new uh, thermostat. I would like to replace this, this quite elderly uh, radiator cap here because I don't necessarily trust it to work the way it's supposed to. Oh, I also noticed something else. If you follow the vacuum lines, there's not really many, but if you follow the vacuum line here, it goes to a T. Uh, this one I unhooked from the, whoops. This one I unhooked from the carb uh, to make sure I could get the valve cover off cleanly. But on the other side over here, on the distributor side, if you look down, that's wide open. You can see right into there. So I'm not sure how we don't have a vacuum leak right now. I, I guarantee you that we do. And I bet fixing that is going to fix, well, part of the drivability issue. The other drivability issue comes, I think, from where to go. Uh, yeah, there it is. That is a catalytic converter. I'm kind of shocked to see that because uh, I wasn't really aware they were doing cats this early. I, of course, wasn't alive, but uh, that's a catalytic converter. And if it's still got converter material in it and it's been running rich, that could be part of the reason we don't have a lot of power. Now, I realize Spitfires don't have a lot of power to begin with, but, I mean, this one doesn't have much at all. So it kind of felt like it should have a little more when I was driving it. And uh, between a vacuum leak uh, and a clogged catalytic converter, that could explain it. Oh, in the interior. Oh boy, you guys confirmed that those are Spitfire seats. I have another question. Is this a Moto Lita steering wheel out of a TR7? Because it sure looks like one to me. Could you get this on a TR6 or a Spitfire? Uh, and also the stereo. From my understanding, that stereo would have been a dealership add-on. It would not have been something that was installed by the factory at the dealership, you would have gone through and found which stereo you wanted in the catalog and the dealer would have put it on. Is that what's happened here? Am I right on that? Let me know. Some of you asked why in the last video I cleaned the car with the top down instead of cleaning it with the top up and cleaning the top at the same time. The answer to that is because I didn't have any cleaner. You're supposed to use vinyl, leather, sort of restorative cleaner on this so that it will rejuvenate the material. It'll put some moisture back into it. Washing it off, and especially scrubbing with something like Dawn dish soap or something, 
it'll start drying it out real quick. Notice this top is actually still really pliable and I'm feeling it here, it still feels really good. It's not like dry and baked. So next time I wash the car, I will have some cleaner on me. And I'm gonna try to look into ways to restore this back window as well because it's not cracked or anything. It's been put down a time or two the wrong way and that results in these, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but these divots in it if you put the top down the wrong way. But by and large, it's in great shape. If we can get it a little clearer, I think I'd be able to use it every day. So maybe I'll look into ways to do that. So to summarize, we're gonna take it in stages. Stage one, the parts I already have in the trunk, uh, brake master cylinder, ball joints, tie rods, valve cover gasket, and a couple other little things. And we're gonna change the oil and the transmission fluid and the diff fluid. And then we'll just keep an eye on the leaks. If we need to do an oil pan gasket down the road, we can do that. If the head gasket actually is leaking, we can always do that down the road too. But uh, I really do think those things will get this back on the road for now. And then the next thing we'll do is fix that rust uh, in the rear trailing arm. We'll do the sway bar bushings and links, clean those at the same time. We'll do steering bushings, steering rack bushings, or we might just get a whole new rack, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and then, yeah, shocks and springs, maybe run new fuel lines. I got under there and noticed that they're the same old fuel lines that were on there from the factory. And then we need to get a couple pieces of hardware for the hard top because the hard top that I got didn't really come with all the hardware that like hooks it down into the car. I think the only other thing I might try to get eventually is a header pipe that eliminates that catalytic converter because of course we don't have emissions around here. And uh, I think it's just robbing some of what little power it has is going to that catalytic converter. So just a quick update today, guys. Just wanted to uh, casually give you a walk around and update on this car. And uh, yeah, hopefully see more of it very soon. See you guys next time. And I also wanna just thank you guys for watching these videos. It's pretty cool uh, to see all the interest in these cars and hear you guys tell stories about how you had one or how you knew someone who had one. I love those stories, keep them coming.